I'm a philosopher um, living in Paris and teaching in London. And very briefly, what I would try to I'll start by uh, introducing the general structure of the seminar, but before that, I just want to tell you that, well, I was trained uh, with Jack Derrida in the deconstruction tradition, so it's been for a while my, let's say, my background, and, and um, for different reasons, because my thesis was, was on plasticity in Hegel. This concept of plasticity led me to discover uh, the central importance of this motif in neurobiology. So I started to, well, to see what it was in neurobiology, this concept. And then I got more and more interested in neurobiology and in biology in general. And then it changed all my, let's say, philosophical frame, all my philosophical concepts, even those of deconstruction. Um, and I discovered that uh, if we follow this neurobiological path, we could perhaps go even further into deconstruction than, than deconstruction itself. And uh, in order to accomplish this radical shift from deconstruction, we had to find new way of thinking, new ways of thinking, new concepts, etc. And it is from that perspective that I will try to interrogate here biopolitics, sovereignty, and life. Okay. I will try to I will ask myself uh, whether we can find new concepts to deeply and genuinely deconstruct sovereignty and consequently also the notions of biopowers. Biopower and biopolitics. I'm not sure we can, it's, it's an, open, an open issue. Um, it is a work in progress. I don't have answers, but um, well, we'll see. We'll see what happens. <coughs> my general, my, let's say, leading thread here is um, deconstruction of sovereignty and Will it ever be deconstructed? Is it really possible to deconstruct sovereignty, the very notion of sovereignty? Okay, we will read here uh, Foucault, Agamben, and Derrida as three main uh, well, attempts at deconstructing or well, produce a critical discourse in sovereignty, in three very important attempts at doing that. And my question here will be, are they successful? in this deconstruction, I think they're not, but why, and is it possible to go beyond their attempts using precisely, as I said, biology and neurobiology, you'll see why. So my general issue here is, uh, is it possible to deconstruct sovereignty and will it, be, will it ever be possible uh, to deconstruct it, or will sovereignty always resist any attempt at deconstructing it? So this is the general issue. So we'll read, um, if I present the general structure of the seminar and the schedule, it will, we'll read, uh, as you know, I guess, Foucault, History of Sexuality, mainly, um, Agamben, Homo Sacker, and The Beast and the Sovereign, by Derrida. Biopolitics and biopower, first of all, are they one and the same? <coughs> For Foucault, we'll see that this afternoon. No, biopolitics and biopower are two different concepts. But for young men, they mean the same thing, they're identical. And for their dad, they're also identical. So this morning, let's say biopolitics and biopower mean one and the same. So biopolitics and biopower are, as you know, the name. That Foucault, which Foucault gives to a new form of power, historically, a new form of power which marks the end of sovereignty in the West at the turn of the 18th, 17th century. This is what he explains in the history of sexuality, we will come back to that text. Foucault says that, uh, yes, at the turn of the 17th century, the old model of 
sovereignty, which means here clearly for Foucault, kingship. Okay? This old model, which he also calls the Leviathan model, so kingship is formed as <coughs> life or as a triangle with the king. Uh, which is like the head of society and all the citizens or subjects forming the body of society. This model of kingship, which for a long time um, amounted to sovereignty, this model is deconstructed by the emergence or appearance of a new form of power, which Foucault calls biopolitics or biopower. Let's consider it's the same thing for the moment. Okay. So we'll see what precisely what biopolitics and biopower mean. But for the moment, very briefly, what appears with this new form of power is the explosion of this Leviathan model. Instead of having this triangle structure, you have the emergence of what Foucault calls also micropowers. That is, instead of having this, you have a proliferation of micropowers at the horizontal level with no head anymore. Okay. So it's about cutting the king's head in society. That is, all of a sudden, this structure, which Hobbes has described in his book, Leviathan, is exploding, and instead of having one centered hierarchical structure, you have this proliferation of mm, multi control uh, so a proliferation of little local uh, domination relationships. Okay? And we will see that this the appearance of this new form of power. It's called biopolitics or biopower because the life of the citizens or the subjects becomes a major stake for politics. Okay? So this is what Foucault analyzes in the history of sexuality. All of a sudden, the subjects are considered well, are treated as living beings and not only as political subjects. So we'll see what this emergence of life on the scene of politics changes in the general structure of power. <coughs> okay? So what is important at the moment is to keep in mind that this biopolitical structure is incompatible with the structure of sovereignty. Okay? As I said, incompatible with this triangle thing. It is incompatible, and for that reason, biopolitics is already in itself, for itself, a deconstruction of sovereignty understood as kingship. Okay. Biopolitics accomplishes the political deconstruction of sovereignty. For many reasons, and we'll try to study why Biopolitics is a new form of power which deconstructs sovereignty. But the main one, the main reason, and it is my second point in this very sketchy introduction, the main reason why biopolitics deconstructs, that is, let's say for the moment, makes sovereignty explode, as I said, it destroys the very notion of sovereignty. So there are many reasons, but the, the main one for me here, the, the one I will um, focus on, is that it, it put an end to what Kantorowicz, in his famous book, The King's Two Bodies, and it, it appears on your handout, I put some quotes on it which are not in the books that I assigned, that's why I put that on, on the sheet, and we will use that, that sheet every time. You know that uh, Kantorowicz wrote this book, The King's Two Bodies, a study in medieval political theology. And Kantorowicz showed that what, what is kingship? Kingship is the theory of the two bodies, in fact, of the king. Okay? The king is not one and the same person, it is two persons in one. 
Why that? Because the king, control it says, has two bodies. One is the natural, biological, mortal, finite bodies, body. And the other is what I will call here the symbolic body, that is the immortal body. So we can read the first quote. <coughs> For, Control it says, the king has in him two bodies, the body natural and the body politic. And natural and politic here means, as, as I just said, uh, finite, mortal, and symbolic, immortal. That is, the body which incarnates the state, which is not the mortal body, but which is the body of the state. As such. His body natural is the body mortal, subject to all infinities that come by nature or accident. But his body politic is a body that cannot be seen or handled, consisting of policy and government. Okay, so you see, on the other hand, the king is the incarnation, the symbolic incarnation of monarchy as such, that is as, as, as the state. Okay? So the king is both mortal and immortal. And this is what a king is. The possibility to articulate these two dimensions of the body. Okay? So, if biopolitics, Foucault shows, and Agamemnon and Derrida will say the same thing, if biopolitics makes kingship explode, it is because it puts an end to these two bodies. Okay? So, if we have two bodies, the symbolic, and the biological, okay? And by your politics, by the proliferation of <coughs> micropowers, I will explain why this proliferation puts an end to the two bodies. But for the moment, let's keep that in mind. Biopolitics is putting an end to the distinction between two kinds of bodies, the symbolic and the biological one. Now, because, because the subjects are considered, uh, are like, well, the subjects are also living beings. We only have, and this is what democracy should be or is, because biopolitics is the emergence of democracy, we have only one. Okay? And even our governors, well, the, well power, like president, prime minister, etc. They are supposed, and this is the principal difference with monarchy, absolute monarchy, we're all supposed to have one body. Okay? So it's the passage, biopolitics is the passage from two bodies to one, which is an interaction between the biological and the symbolic. We are, well, it, it is a profound transformation of this separation, of this distinction, and it's fusion into one thing. Okay. So I will explain what, what it means. So biopolitics marks not only the end of a structure of power, that is of kingship, but also the end of a philosophical and theoretical framework that is the one which appears as structured, profoundly structured by the difference, uh, irreducible difference between the symbolic and the biological. Okay? I don't it marks the end of this like At such a point that, for example, if you read Agamben, and we'll come back to that in two days, or tomorrow, tomorrow, such a point that in, her, in the person of the Führer, Hitler, both bodies, the symbolic and the biological, conflates, and this is what Agamben explains on page one, 184. We read that passage in a moment. The uh, very 
form of that identity between the logical and the symbolic becomes manifest in the, in the person of the theorem. And this is the ambiguity, and this is my third point, the ambiguity of biopolitics is that it marks at the same time the emergence of democracy, as I said. We, we have one, one body and one only, right? both the symbolic and biological, and no distinction between both. So it is the emergence of the democratic subject as such, but it is also the emergence of the contrary of democracy. This is also the emergence of the possibility of the Führer of Nazism and Fascism. And this is this ambiguity that both Foucault and Agamben are, and also Derrida, are analyzing is why is the very structure of democracy able to give way to its radical opposite, its radical contrary, and why is it that when the society is not structured any longer as it used to be, as this triangle structure, when everybody is equal, on the same level, with one, one body and one only, how comes that this very structure, which is the structure of equality, may give way to its contrary, that is to fascism. Mm. Okay, so we'll see why for these authors, for these philosophers, uh, the end of the conflict between uh, the symbolic and the magical gives way to uh, the most extreme danger. And why this power of life, biopower, becomes uh, a lethal power, that is the power of death, in which is very clear in Gambia. My last point in this very sketchy introduction is that if this is so, if, if the most democratic structure gives way to the most fascist structure, it is because according to these philosophers, in fact, our politics is secretly re-elaborating and reintroducing the difference between the symbolic and the magical that it seemed to deconstruct. Okay. So what Foucault and Gamben and even Derrida will show is that in fact biopolis is a deconstruction of sovereignty and is not. Okay. That the deconstruction is only apparent. Is only, I mean, uh, is only a, um, is an illusion, something like a cover-up. But that in fact, behind this deconstruction, the old dichotomy between the symbolic and the logical remains and still has to be constructed. Okay? So, we have, if you want, a double deconstruction of sovereignty. The first one is accomplished by biopolitics itself historically. Okay? This is what Foucault shows. You have a first historical deconstruction of sovereignty, which is the emergence of these biopowers. Mm and the emergence of the political subject as having one body only. But you have the philosophical deconstruction of this deconstruction, Foucault and Ben uh, who show that, in fact, this deconstruction, this political deconstruction, has to be deconstructed a second time because it's only an, appear an appearance, it's only an illusion, and that the difference between uh, the biological and the symbolic uh, remains to be done. Okay. And then there is our intervention in this seminar, which is the last moment, which is, is this the construction of the construction of sovereignty? Is it successful? Are we uh, are we done? With the dichotomy between the symbolic and the logical. I think we're not. I think that even, and this will be my point from the cinema, I think that even if <coughs> Foucault, Gambé, and Derrida uh, try, the three of them, even in, in very different ways, we'll see that, of course their discourses are different, but uh, even if they try very hard to put an end to this difference, the difference
it still remains. And hence, for sure, is it possible to reconstruct sovereignty? Is it really possible to go beyond this dichotomy? This is my general. Oh, I'll explain more. Did you have questions for the moment? So, uh, is it clear? So, I will, I will um, now give you the schedule. I'm sorry I should have done that earlier. But. So, today, this morning, is the general introduction. We'll present, we'll develop all. Well, everything that I just said, put that into place. This afternoon we'll focus on Foucault, um, sovereignty and biopolitics, how it works in Foucault, and we'll read the um, history of sexuality and um, a bit of a society must be defended. Okay? So we'll read some passages uh, from this. So please bring the two books. And tomorrow morning, Saturday, and, uh, we'll focus on on the soccer, okay, we'll read the gambe. And in the afternoon, I would like to put into, well, put the three discourses, Foucault, Gambe, and Derrida, in, into perspective. I would like to focus on the motives of the king's two bodies, you know, each of them, Derrida, Foucault, and Gambe, refer to Kantorowicz's book. So, tomorrow, tomorrow afternoon, we'll read. Um, Foucault, bring the handouts. We read Agamben, the reference to Kantorowicz is on paragraph 5. And the last chapter, mostly on page 184, and the last page. Okay. And Derrida refers to Kantorowicz in the 11th session of The Beast and the Sovereign, from, page, from pages 285. To three or three. Okay. So tomorrow afternoon is the King's Two Bodies. Uh, there are three references to Kontrovitz. And then Sunday, Derrida, the Beast and the Sovereign, and also a few passages from Acts of Religion, Faith and Knowledge. And then in the afternoon, I don't know. Uh, I don't know, I still don't know. Shall we have a general discussion or? Shall I do more of there? We'll see at that point where we where we are. Um, if we need to go back, we'll, we'll, we'll see. Okay? But the general structure is like that. So Foucault today, again and tomorrow. In the afternoon, the king's two bodies, and then they're done, and then we'll see. So, so every time you want to interrupt, you just copies of those particular excerpts, or if you have a computer, I can have digital copies of all the books oh, in mm -hmm. full format available for you. Yeah, because I, you know, I can't make copies if there are too many yeah, 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 pages, yeah, or, and sometimes I just change my mind and read an old page. You see what I mean? Yeah, so. Yeah, I can, yeah, all of the text in full are on uh, Databases online, and I can either show you where they are or you uh, So, as I said, um, so I will present now a general introduction explaining what I just presented very briefly. Um, as I said, the question is will sovereignty ever be deconstructed, which also, mean, which also means uh, can we really? Put an end to the dichotomy between the symbolic and the magical body. Okay. This is this is really um, my question. So I will of course explain what this means. What is a magical body and what is a symbolic of course body? If, if we if we refer to um, to Kantorowicz, you know, the king's two bodies, the king has two bodies, one mortal and the other. Uh, polity. It means that in a way, well, this meaning remains the same. What, what would we say? Can we go beyond the dichotomy between the symbolic and the magical? It means that 
we would still have the two kinds of bodies in us. Something which is just mortal, just animal, animal body, and something else. Which perhaps is not immortal, but which is not reducible to the animal body. Right? Right. We would have in our body something more, something different from, different and then more, than the only you know, natural, biological, animal dimension. It would be something else. For example, if you read Heidegger, in time. It is immediately clear, Heidegger says, we are living beings, but this is not all the, the whole of us. Okay? We are living beings, but we also exist. Okay? We live and we exist. And the two things are not synonymous. As living beings, we are animals, we share condition of all living creatures, but as human beings, we are existing, means that we have a special relationship to death, that we have a symbolic relationship to our destiny, finitude, or whatever. Okay? So is it possible to go beyond that? It is not obvious. And how is it possible, as a philosopher, it is, of course, a very uh, central question to me. How is it possible to go on doing philosophy if we give up that distinction? <coughs> because it seems that philosophy is built, well, continental philosophy, is built on this distinction. We're dealing with existence, we're dealing with finitude, we're dealing with being toward death, we're dealing with uh, the meaning of life, we're dealing with the authenticity of existence. We're designed and we're not only animals, so is it possible to go beyond that distinction? Okay. For example, if you're interested in the brain, if you're interested in biology, is it, are you still doing philosophy? Okay. So I might, I would like, this is what I would like to do personally, okay? to, to put an end to all that distinction. And, okay. So, you understand that what I aim here is at presenting a critique of these notions of uh, biopolitics and biopower, which again were fashioned in Foucault, by Foucault, and which appear for the first time very clearly in the history of sexuality and um, in the, uh, what is it, the uh, first volume, The Will to Knowledge. Then, were, which were re-elaborated re by Agamben in Homo Sacer, and more recently by Derrida in The Beast and the Sovereign. So it took, took me some time to understand why I resisted these notions so much, and why, although persuaded by the accuracy and interest of Foucault's Agamben's and Derrida's analysis, I was still resisting these notions, and I can say that the main reason why is, as I said, because the distinction between the biological and the symbolic seems to me absolutely um, well, seems to me unfair. This is the adjective I would use. Unfair. Unfair to what? Unfair to biological life. I think that's what they call biopolitics, biopower, etc., etc. is absolutely mm, not dealing with biology. Even though the three authors insist on this prefix, that bios, bios, bio, biology, biology, has nothing to do with biology. And those, this is what I will show. And that's why the distinction persists in their philosophies between the symbolic and the biological is because they don't really take the biological seriously. So it is true that the three of them 
challenge very strongly, each in their own way. The classical definition of life, as it can be found in phenomenology, for example, they all challenge the distinction, the metaphysical distinction between, on the one hand, biological, material, empirical life, and on the other, spiritual, intellectual life. The three of them challenge that distinction. You know about, if you're a little bit familiar with biology, with Husserl, for example, you know that Husserl makes the distinction between the body on the one hand and the flesh on the other. So this is another name for the distinction between the biological and the symbolic. You have in German Körper, which is the body, which will refer to Husserl very generally. And this body is common to animals, humans, but also to physical objects. This is a, a Körper. Okay? So it is the objective, in a way, the objective body, the physical, empirical, material one. And on the other hand, life, in German, which is the flesh. In French, la chair, which you find so often in Yahoo, for example. Okay. And the flesh is uh, the spiritual dimension of the body. Okay. So in phenomenology, for example, you still find the dichotomy of the king, the king's two bodies. We still, for Phenomenology is we're still constituted of two bodies, like one is material, physical, mortal, <coughs> and the other is the spiritual one. I can't really agree with life, does not. I think life does not refer to the physical body. Life does not refer to mental states or flesh. Well, this is Rousseau's um, concept. Okay. Mm -hmm. What he calls the uh, incarnated body. Okay, so perhaps in usual term it is not the term, but in phenomenology it is. Okay, curve on light, which is very difficult to define, but I think you see what I mean. Like, What is it? How would you define it in your own terms? I wonder if, uh, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm not sure if I'm answering your question, but I wonder if neurobiology doesn't reproduce this uh, distinction in the distinction between brain and mind. If the mind doesn't stand somehow, not exactly the same, but to flesh. Yeah, yeah sure, sure, of course. The, the problem uh, is. beyond it. Okay? But for the moment I want to make sure that we understand this dis distinction itself. So what is it? How would you define I, I think that no, everybody understands proper body, uh, material, empirical, mortal, algebra. But what is the second one? Traits of the human that we think to be exclusively human? Yes, like? Not consciousness? Mm -hmm. The question of consciousness? The question of consciousness, if you want. Yeah. Self consciousness, highly abstracted language. Yes, but it, this is not the body. Mm -hmm. so the body of that, what is it? Conscious body, what is it? In my kind of language, it has to do with a um, combination of like a concept of proprioception, uh -huh. like a, a body that 
is able to navigate a, a symbolic space or a set of symbolic uh, codes or kind of a symbolic, symbolic precinct or structure without it uh, happening at the level of conscious mind um, in the sense of like that that jurisprudence is followed, that protocols are understood, that one learns through a pattern of habit. Mm -hmm. In my mm -hmm. language, it has something to do with habit, and okay. repetition, and appropriate perception. So that movement of the body below a level of conscious interrogation as to why I would be knowing how to interact with something that has become second nature. Um, yeah, but the, the biological body is also mm -hmm. under consciousness level. Okay? So what you say is right, but it's not enough. Okay? Um, and the flesh of the world are one and the same and equates with what you just said about this interaction between the body and the world. So what is what is that? What is the flesh of the world? What, what is this interaction about? It, and he says it is not biological. So what is it? Metaphysics. Yeah, but what is it in your body? This distinction, what does it refer to? Is it the, I mean, the spiritual body? Yes, so what is, of course, it is the spiritual mm -hmm. body, so how would you define it? Yeah, of course, it has to do with spirits, mm -hmm. and not so much with consciousness, it's more it's spirits. Nice. So, what is it, the spiritual body? Uh, I'm, I'm not very familiar with that. Um, uh, spirit is born, is, is, is it Hegel? Um, the no, but this incarnation of a like the, 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 that I said that I'm just going to, because I just heard it, you know, and, and I just um, in my mind I just saw that. Um, cool. This is this is what Hegel would right. say to me. Now, so for you, if there's a one and the same body, what, if if there's only one body, without the distinction between the natural and the Spiritual, then for you, spirit is a bone. No, no, no. And no, but this is what Hegel would say. Okay? Because for him, it is very clear that spirit is not a bone. Precisely, okay? But we shouldn't make the confusion between the spiritual and the meat. Otherwise, you get phrenology. That was his yeah, was critique of Critique of phrenology, phrenology which was the first attempt to, 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 to abolish the distinction within the biological and symbolic. But let's try to go a little, a little bit further. What is the spiritual body? Precisely the, the body which is not a bone. Uh, what is a spiritual body? In the, I mean, in the Christian part. Hmm? I mean, maybe that infinite body. Yeah, but um, I need some explanation. In Christianity, I think it would be the immortal body, the body that yeah. you know yeah. that, that goes to heaven and is you know, judged. And, and <coughs> so, for uh, if we if we don't think of Christianity, but for for us, let's say. But I think for us, it's a, it's a very problematic concept. That's, uh, for sure. You know that, that has these, <laughs> it has these, these Christian like it, it has these Christian overtones that. that Absolutely, it is difficult. But so, what is it? You know, I'm very. <laughs> what is it? Yeah. I don't know what it is, but a word that comes to mind. <laughs> yes. <laughs> a word that comes to mind for me is animation. Uh, sort of that which yes. animates okay. the body. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Something which would animate the body, exactly. And so, what 
what is the difference between a biological living body and the an animated incarnated one? Like spiritually incarnated, spiritually animated. Perhaps going back to that that part of being and part of existence, mm -hmm. the animation coming from the being. What is the difference between living and existing? I, I don't know if I can answer that question either, but it goes back to uh, <laughs> body body and flesh, body and corpse, if you will. It's not, yeah, just, yeah. it's not just an animation of the body, but the body animating and falling off, or the you know the flesh falling from the body, a body of work. Um, I think that I think this level is where the difference is between animated and inanimate, but, uh, corpse and body. Mm. Okay, uh, but well, of course, it is a very difficult question. That's not one answer. But let's say to, to make things well, rather simple. Now, no one will say, and Rousseau also will say, what is the flesh? It is the body proper. What they call the body proper, which is the body. What is it to animate my body? It is the body which I can appropriate as being mine. Okay? Right? This is what they call in philology the, bo the body proper, the proper body. Which is mine. It is the subjectivated body. Mm. No, I, I, as Catherine Malakou, I have a body, I, I am this body, and this body is mine. It means that, for example, the biological body, uh, you, you can all, of course say, my heart, my liver, uh, my, I don't know, gallbladder, or whatever. But this is not, this does not make sense. This is what Yolo will say, or Rousseau will say. It, it has no, to say, my, well, organ, whatever organ, doesn't make sense, because this is something I cannot appropriate. This is something which forever remains, of, well, in the domain of objectivity, I can't really say my, I don't know, my kidney, right? Because this does not really belong to me, why? Because I cannot subjectivate it. You cannot... Phenomenologists will say you cannot build a schema out of it. You cannot have any representation of it, you know, it's only objective. You can see it through medical imagery, for example, but you cannot really subjectivate, feel it, okay? The spiritual body is on the contrary, the body which is mine. It is the body which you can project in space, okay? It is most of the time the body which is used in art, in the aesthetic dimension, it is the body which belongs to me. It is the subjective body. Okay? You, you were talking about proprioception, it is exactly that. <coughs> this, and, well, what, what is it then? It, it is true that this body, this spiritual body which is mine, is not a biological entity for them. It is the interaction, the result of the interaction between your being and the world. That's what Jean Ponty says. It's the interaction of two fleshes, uh, the flesh of the world and the flesh of my body. Right? It is not something which exists within your body. It is something which exists at the surface, on the surface, between you and the world. And this is quite different, phenomenologists said, say. It is quite different from the material, empirical, natural body. a very particular um, interpretation of body and spirit. And for instance, um, Spinoza represented two very different conceptions. Ah, but Spinoza is very, very ill-considered by these people. <laughs> ill-considered. Okay. I sure. quite agree with you. For Spinoza, there is no... Spinoza is, I would say, the only philosopher 
for whom the distinction between the symbolic and the logical doesn't exist. Uh, for Spinoza, there is only one body with the conatus, this impulse while the uh, endeavor, tendency to endeavor in life. Um, and it is true that um, for Spinoza, this notion of the flesh was, does not exist. Okay? But it is not surprising that Heidegger had never read Spinoza. There's no. Well, Spinoza has a very particular place in history. Is, yes. there, is there a reason why Heidegger has never read Spinoza? Do you know anything about that? It's difficult to say. <laughs> But um, you know that, well, I don't know if you know that, but there's a text by Levinas in which he says that uh, we can understand why Spinoza was excommuni excommunicated from the Jewish community. You know that? Mm -hmm. And Levinas says uh, he was excommunicated and this was the right thing. Uh, Levinas says, oh, I'm not Spinoza. So even the Jewish people don't like Spinoza. Nobody likes him. I like him. I, 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 I do. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I mean, it's not surprising if all the people who go study here and all the people who believe in this distinction, that's practically all philosophers, don't read Spinoza. I think the only one who does is Marx. You understand what is at stake here is that if, if you if you if you maintain that there's only one body, yeah, and you're quite right, you know that it, it, this is exactly what he says, then you're considered a materialist. Okay? So then we'll have to, to discuss about materialism itself, and perhaps we can do that in the last session precisely. If you're interested. Because well, we also have to ask ourselves if materialism really goes beyond the distinction between the two bodies. We still have to wonder about that, even in Marx. It's not always clear, but um, I quite agree with you, and you know that Damasio, the neurologist, wrote this book, um, um, what is that about Spinoza? Looking, Looking for Spinoza, yeah. yes, exactly. Which in, in French is Spinoza, but it's all Spinoza was right. <laughs> <laughs> Descartes' era, Spinoza was right. Yeah. Um, so he says, the master says, Spinoza was the first neurobiologist, like proto neurobiologist, I would say. So I quite agree with you that this distinction between flesh and body is not Spinozist at all. But let's say that, generally speaking, if you accept Spinoza and perhaps some, some materi uh, ancient materialists, this is where we see the distinction spiritual body and Logical body. So, as I said, the proper body, the flesh, is um, the ideal spatial body. I mean, the body that you project, which is yours, which you project at the intersection or surface between the world and your own uh, being. So, it is clear that for Foucault Derrida Agamemnon, this distinction has to be challenged, and they all want to, to get over it. Like, they all want to. <laughs> They don't have a Spinozist discourse, but still, uh, they want to overcome that distinction. You know, the construction, the idea, the construction is all about that. Derrida's first book, The Voice and Phenomenon, is on Husserl precisely, and it is the first attempt to, 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 to overcome the distinction. And Derrida says there's only one body. And the distinction between the ideal body and the material body is what is what has to be constructed. So when they talk about life, the three of them, life as it is including biopower, biopolitics, when they talk about life, normally we should understand that there's only one life, okay? Material and symbolic all at once with no distinction. And yet, okay, I maintain, and this is what I want to prove here in the 
understand. I maintain that this distinction between body and flesh, or between the king's, well, no, politic, body and natural body, uh, this distinction persists in current continental philosophy. That it is not at all over, well, uh, deconstructed and that it remains to be. So first of all, I will show, uh, this, this will be my first point in this introduction, I will show how the three authors, for the moment I don't make any distinction between them. The distinctions will come afterward in each uh, particular part of the seminar. Um, so I won't make any distinction between them for the moment. In the first moment, I will try to show how the three of them when they analyze the passage from kingship to biopolitics, how the three of them deconstruct the distinction between the biological and the symbolic. How do they do that? This will be my first point. And then my second point will be why, according to me, they fail. All right. And my third point will be, and if we don't finish this morning, we'll extend this afternoon. My third point will be why I say that and why um, I was talking about um, being unfair toward biology. Why? What do I mean by biology? And, you know, okay, so I will explain myself. Okay, so first point, how do they deconstruct the distinction? Second, why they fail. Well, when I say fail, you understand what I mean. It's relatively speaking, of course. And third, uh, why do I mean by biology and why all this has to be reconsidered? What is symbolic life? So this will be my first point. linguistic entity, that is, the symbolic is the domain of the symbol, that is a linguistic act. explain what the symbolic means after Kantorowicz, they will detail the notion and give two meanings to this term. The first one is uh, based on the symbol, which is the linguistic act, and the symbolic body means the body which is transformed into a symbol. meaning of the symbolic body is the body made into a symbol. So I, I will explain immediately what, what it means. But this is a linguistic entity. You know, for example, the uh, balance is the, the symbol of justice. Okay. This is the, uh, like an image mm -hmm. or a sign or whatever which represents something. So the symbolic body, first of all, is the body constituted as a symbol. But there is another meaning of the symbolic, which is the symbolic as such, which is an order. And this is more complex, you know, that Lacan is talking about the symbolic. Do you know that? 
Have you heard of that? And in that sense, it is not at all the same meaning. It dis designates something. Uh, it appears for well, the first appearance of the notion of a symbolic. Do you know what, where that comes from? The first time when symbolic and not symbol, but symbolic, the symbolic as a substantive, do you know where it comes from? Was it the near stage discourse in Lacan? Yes, so it, it is Lacan, but there's somebody else just before. Saussure. Sorry? Saussure. Saussure. But Saussure is yeah. more. You remember it, it distinguishes between uh, sign and symbol? Mm -hmm. So it's not exactly Saussure. Even if you're right, Saussure will give uh, the symbolic. It's Is it Roman Jacobson? Yes. Yes, Jacobson, yes, and, and, and the, a, a great reader of Jacobson. Levi Strauss. Okay? <laughs> Levi Strauss, yes. The, symbolic, the notion of the symbolic. You're quite right, comes from, it is derived from linguistics, and particularly contemporary linguistics, with uh, Saussure, and then Jacobson, and then the great reader of Jacobson. The Strauss. <coughs> Do you know where? <coughs> where? The Strauss talks about this in And Lacan, Lacan will borrow his definition of the, of the symbolic two measures. Okay? It is a structuralist notion. Do you know where it appears for the first time? You know, Levi Strauss wrote this introduction to Marcel Mauss' mm -hmm. essay, which is the gift. The gift. And uh, so Marshall, the, the famous anthropologist, wrote this essay. Is it the gift or on the, the gift? Because um, in French we say essay, what? Well, it is on the gift, but I think in English it's the gift. And Lewis Strauss wrote this introduction, and here introduces the notion of the symbolic. What, what does that mean, the symbolic? No? <coughs> Precisely, um, the symbolic is the name which Levi Strauss gives to what cannot be material, to, to what cannot be defined as uh, precisely natural, empirical, or material. This is this dimension of reality which exists, which has a material presence, but which is not material. Okay? Lacan will say, like, a bit later, they say we have three dimensions, you know, symbolic, um, the real, and the imaginary. So the symbolic is what is not real. L let, let's say, keep that definition for the moment. We, it is something which is not real. What does that mean? So the essay is the essay on, on the gift. You know that most is defining the gift as a circulation. Okay. And perhaps you know this dimension of economy. The gift is the very foundation of economy. And this is why Levi Strauss introduces the notion of the symbolic, because uh, most already notices that in the very economy of gift, what is given is not only material things. Okay? The gift is not only the circulation of goods or of money. It is something else. 
it is not for human beings, let's use this um, term. Economy is based, of course, on material exchanges. We exchange goods and money, etc. But there is something included in these material things which is not material, which is the in intention to give back what most calls counter gift. Okay? When I give something, when I give you something, I accept a counter gift. I, ex I, I expect an exchange. That is, it is the system of debt. Okay? That is of expecting something from the gift which is not material, which is reciprocality, which is the debt, which is the circuit of exchange. Uh, and this dimension, which is not material, which is like the intention which is contained in the thing, is what Levi Strauss called the symbolic. Okay. <coughs> the symbolic value. Uh, Marx has also this um, approach to the value, the exchange value. Uh, a value is not is not only something material; it, it is also something spiritual. Let's say because um, uh, it gives the material thing a spiritual dimension, which has to be counter gifted or. Mm, which has to, <coughs> to be involved in the circuit of exchange and gift and counter gift. So, Levishtro says, if, well, in this introduction, it's a very, a very beautiful text, I advise you to reread it or to read it, it's beautiful, because Levishtro says, when we exchange values, material values, goods, when we change, uh, women, goods, uh, etc., etc., you know, the processes of exchanges in the rules. We also exchange something which has no value, which has no material value, which is this intention to counter gift. We produce the expectation in the one to whom we give something, we produce the expectation of the counter gift. We're waiting for the gift to be uh, reciprocated. So when we exchange something, when we exchange values, we also produce something which has no value, which Levi Strauss will also call in this text the value zero. Okay? The zero material. Value zero meaning the materially speaking zero, something which has no body precisely, which is not reducible to money or good or whatever, which is purely symbolic, okay? meaning that it has a value but a value zero. That is zero materiality. It has a great value but zero materiality. Value zero, um, or Levi Strauss, and here he reads Jack Jacobson. He says, it is like in language, generally speaking, and here uh, you are very right to mention Jacobson because it is, it is exactly like that that language functions. Jacob, Jacobson already said, in all languages, you have some words which don't mean anything, and which function as value zeros. So in primitive societies, all the names uh, who, which design the sacred are value zeros. Value zeros, yes. For example, mana, most people take this example, which means the sacred doesn't mean anything. Um, and Deleuze has written a beautiful text in the logic of sense about that. And then with Carol creating these kind of words which don't mean anything. And we have that in our everyday language like gimmick or thing or you know, truc in French. doesn't mean anything. We have many of these words which we use and which don't mean anything. And at the same time, which are, which are absolutely important because they give, they confer a maximum value, symbolic value to all the other words. 
So in every economy, linguistic or material, uh, in every economy, we have the material dimension of things. And words have a meaning, uh, goods have a value, but we also have zeros. Levi Strauss talks about holes in economies, like void entities, which are the symbolic values, okay, in, in linguistic and in economy. Right? Okay? And this is also the origin of the sake of the sake period. God is a value zero. The, the main example for Levi Strauss of the symbolic is God. God is irreducible to material value, whatever. Okay? So Levi Strauss will show that all our systems, in general, all our systems, economical, uh, symbol, um, linguistic, etc., etc., are system of exchanges, material exchanges, but that they can function only because we there are holes in it. These holes being value zeros. And with that, you know, it's like these games, in these games, I don't know how to call that, you have these little squares that you have to push. There's a, a void one in the uh, beginning. Tetris and puzzle pictures. Puzzle pictures, yeah. So it functions out of a gap of the hole and you have to move it while you understand them. Okay? And Lemstra says it wouldn't function, a system would, uh, would not be able to function without this hole. Okay? For us, for us human, and this is the main distinction uh, with the animals. Okay? The animals, and, and this is also what Lacan says, and this is also something we, we should discuss in the end of the seminar, the animals are supposedly not concerned with the symbolic. They don't have this idea of value zero, gap, void, the uh, will also say, floating signifier. Uh, the, the humans, all human systems function because of this, uh, these holes or zeros or, you know, So, in fact, the symbolic body, to come back to the notion, is both the body which is able to be transformed into a symbol, and it is also the value zero. My body proper is my value zero. That is something in me which is irreducible to the biological body. Okay? Something which is uh, not material, which is this non non well non empirical kind of existence, which produces at the same time the value of my biological body. It is, is it clear? So the, the, the difference is that there is no distinction. Between there is, but uh, I mean, from the point of view of these people, even there in there is. Those? Even in the Strauss. Okay? Even in the Strauss. For example, in all that, for the Strauss, there is one uh, universal trait among humans, which is, do you know what is it? What it is, sorry. There's one thing that uh, exists beyond all cultures, well, in every culture, which is the prohibition of incest. Okay? If incest is prohibited, according to him, it is because we have, we have this symbolic body, okay, which prevents us from committing incest. Or, all our, let's say, for, for the shows, all the uh, taboos, all the uh, interdict, well, the interdiction uh, are motivated by, by the symbolic. But uh, is the is the symbolic body that you mentioned uh, material instead? Well, it, it is like 
it is like in it, well, it is like in language, for example, the word gimmick or mana, even. it has a material existence because it exists. It is a word like another, like any other, but at the same time it doesn't because it has no meaning. Okay? So the symbolic body for us is it exists, but is it it exists as not existing. It is what you it is your own projection. It is your freedom. Okay? It is what you're doing with your body. Something you can play with, some, something you can mm, constitute as such, something you, you can shape, something you can project, something you can uh, constitute. Rather than with your magical body, you can't do anything. It does not really, well, you, you cannot, well, it is material. defining what is the normal functioning of the body and the pathological one. So, biology is what introduces the notion of the norm into uh, life. Okay? In natural history, you didn't have this notion of norm. If you read Aristotle, for example, when he classifies the living species, you don't you just find a description. Okay? So, birds are like that, fish are like that, human beings are like that, but you, you don't, Aristotle never says this is what is no, normal and this is what is pathological. It is, <laughs> this, <laughs> it is a little, anyway, you, you never, there's no values, you see what I mean? Of course, shows that on the contrary, when Baji described the bodies, it should be neutral, but it's never neutral. It's always normative. Is, here is what a normal function is, here is what a pathological function is. And what is a normal? What is a normal body? A normal body is a body which has a head. This head being a center. The normal body is a hierar hierarchical body, mini Leviathan, as you exactly said. This is what is normal. And a pathological body is a dismembered body. It's a body which is totally fragmented. Um, see? That's why he has such a hard time talking about ants and the little bugs that do have this same structure, that reproduce this structure. Is that a call in, in yes. the text on the structure of animals? That you, there are these certain species and you just can't really have anything to say yeah. about them? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Who's Aristotle? Aristotle. Mm. Yeah, um, um, Hegel says um, <laughs> that uh, Aristotle produces nothing less. <laughs> <laughs> which is awful to say such a thing, but because, so, well, Aristotle uh, doesn't have value judgments, you know, he doesn't value things, right, just describes. That, that is, of course, the great genius of Aristotle, to be able not to 
But anyway, Foucault says, on the contrary, no, biology is a normative discourse, and a normal body is a body who functions as a mini Leviathan. It means that a body which obeys to a certain kind of unity, center, uh, and which is not fragmented, multiple, precisely. So you see what, that when Foucault will value multiplicity, dissemination will be again against uh, this biological unity. So he will show that biological concepts, as he says, are immediately transgressive. They immediately open themselves to a normative, well, they immediately disappear as scientific concepts to become normative concepts. Uh, so you have several concepts like that in Foucault, you have uh, functions, tissue, mm -hmm. he has very interesting uh, analysis of the concept of tissue, milieu, membrane, etc. So there's no biological category that does not, uh, that escape uh, this, this, well, this becoming normative. Okay? So it means that biological concepts are immediately edible by politics. They are immediately normative. And if, you understand that, if biopolitics is finally not a deconstruction of sovereignty, it is because of biology. Okay? And so this is something we'll keep in mind before we break. For Foucault, as well as for Gambin and Gerda, biology is always, always linked with sovereignty. Okay? This is something which is never deconstructed in their discourse. Foucault shows that biology, in its emergence, is normative. Okay? And when it appears at the 18th century, in the 18th century, or the turn of the 17th century, it is normative right from the beginning, but it remains normative. Okay. So this definition of biology as, we, as constituting our bodies as mini Leviathans is absolutely undeconstructed by the three of them. Okay. It means that biology, even now, I mean, uh, under the forms of genetics, whatever, Biology, well, they don't even specify, biology as such, is what? But is the, the, the very, is the model of the most normative of all discourses. <coughs> and this culminates in Deleuze's definition of what a deconstructive body should be, which is a body without organs, which is going to be the most hateful of all notions. Stand up. I mean, body without organ. B W O. You, you, you can even give it. You know, sometimes he calls that B W O. But it's just a pure symbolic. It's a, it's an empty sitting fire. It's this, this void. Do, my body W O. My B W O. Um, all right. So the problem is that. You, you can always say that in order to overcome the distinction between the natural and the symbolic, you will value multiple bodies, fragmentation, and dissemination, as long as you believe in the BWO, you won't deconstruct anything. Okay? So this, this is my, as long as you will see biology as a normative discourse, as long as you won't update your concept of biology, and as long as you will consider biology and consequently also the biological as something like determined, obscure, um, with no autonomy, then, um, then you won't go nowhere. I mean, you won't go anywhere. Okay? So perhaps I'm a bit violent. <laughs> <laughs> but no, the B W O no. No. Okay? This is the very you know B 
kingdom, you know, is the very incarnation of the symbolic. There, there's no better name for it. You know, when we were looking, I remember this one, we were looking for a name, for a definition of symbolic, this is the best way, the best you can find. But couldn't one say it's pure, pure material, the being that we know? Oh yeah, they are very, very, very talented to play with words. Oh, but we're, you know, like, oh, we said the same thing, but the symbolic is the most real. <laughs> no, I'm used to that. You see, you see what I mean? Like, yeah. This is what deconstruction is about. Like, oh, I could have said the contrary. You see? So, This is the most material, the most material, <coughs> the, not, not biological, the kind of materiality. Um, <laughs> no, I know all that. I have, um, I have a question, uh, maybe sticking my neck out, but I, from the moment I read and thought about body and blood organs, mm -hmm. I saw it from a very developmental biological not a symbolic thing, of the actual, that moment of fertilization of an egg as a completely undifferentiated space that has no organs, that is a biological body that somehow, and this is all the genetic sort of developmental theories, come into play to construct the body with mm -hmm. organs precisely mm -hmm. later. And so that was the way I always thought about it. So it's interesting to... Yes, I know that um, it's very interesting, and you're quite right. And, and it's true that if we are fair with the laws, um, it is true that this uh, non-organic thing is not at all something <coughs> immaterial, you're right, and that it is a certain state or step in the formation of the organism. I agree. And that is true that the laws in particular is very aware of uh, the biology of his time, etc. He was the first to get interested into the brain, in the brain, etc. This is true. But it is also true that this notion of BWO plays another another role at the same time. I, I don't know if you remember these passages about anorexia, mm -hmm. where it says that not eating is a way to resist our biological body, that using the BWO is a way to resist our biological um, So it's both. It's very ambiguous. It's both. Of course, it is very rooted in biology, and but it is also uh, for them. You know, freedom is clearly at some well, not always, but at some moment. It, what is it to be free? It, it's to be able to resist the the empirical, the like the fate fatality of the biological. The incredible passage of anorexia. Um, or a kind of freedom. It's, it seems like um, it's about decay as well. And hold, if, if it's a body without organs, then you're holding any kind of decay at bay. Um, mm -hmm. and, and it seems like there's not an acknowledgement of of death, or sort of, to use kind of theological, you know, term, like, like, not an acknowledgement that there's a kingdom or a world here and now. Like, if you if you're not acknowledging that our bodies have organs, you're not acknowledging um, the humanity, the decay, of death, and therefore the life. It feels like in some ways, if you're not acknowledging that it's our bodies that take us there. In all of its biology, <laughs> or all of its cycle, then you're not acknowledging the. Um, uh, I don't understand. Yeah. Mm. Or we can we can also introduce a distinction within death itself, the concept of death, which they do, uh, different differentiating the biological. Decay, and the existential 
being told is prepared. And only a body without organs right. should be able to die properly, as Heidegger said. Mm -hmm. okay? And decay, logical decay, is the animal. Mm -hmm. okay. You know that Heidegger says something like animals don't die. Because they can subjectively appropriate the occurrence yeah. of death. Yeah. So only a beatable hero is able to die properly. Okay? So this is also something we'll have to work on. Like what is an authentic uh, notion of die, dying? It's even worse for stones and Heidegger. Yeah. <laughs> no world at all. Yeah. <laughs> So, um, we will have go deeper into Foucault this afternoon.